the need for mindfulness and wisdom. 22 July, 1962 Namo tasa pakavato arahato samma sambutasa Lisankara gadang zitang tarnhanang kaya madzagadi Tamapada 154 My zitta has attained beyond sankaras. I have attained the end of tarnha. We have been ordained in the Buddhasasana, and whatever race or lineage we come from, we should realize that we have entered that known as the Sakya lineage, which is the lineage of the Kattiya. For the Lord Buddha came from the Sakya lineage, and renounced the state of royalty with all its wealth, and even his partner in developing the perfections, in other words, his wife and his son, who were like his own heart. He was able to give them up for the aim of Anuttara Sammasambhotinyarna, the story of the Lord Buddha, from the time when he first left home until he attained the state of the Buddha, was a story of obstacles and difficulties that he met at every step on the path along which he went, and which he overcame every time. The path along which all the Buddhas have travelled is difficult and hard, and a person who does not have the true diligence and effort will not be able to escape from the snares of Mara. All of us who are followers of the Lord Buddha must examine and see the way which the Lord Buddha went, and we must have a firm intention in our hearts to tread in the footsteps of the Lord. The words Subhartibanno, Ujubhartibanno, Nyaya Partibanno, Zamiji Partibanno, Bhagavato, Zalvaka Sankho are nothing but signposts set up by the Lord for all the Zalvakas to follow, so that the title of Zalvaka Sankho may be appropriate to them, for it means that they are the true Zalvakas of the Lord Buddha. The word Zalvaka means one who listens who listens with his eyes, his ears, and with the thoughts of his mind. From day to day he is not idle in his thoughts, which search out the reasons for things, so that he may take care of himself and be self-controlled for the purpose of going on to become one who has purity of sila and who has samadhi in order to attain a state of calm which steadily becomes more and more unshakable, so as to have banya, which searches for knowledge and skill to embellish himself. Apart from this, one cannot call anyone a savaka of the Lord. Now, at this time, all of us here have given up working for our livelihood since we were ordained into the Buddhasasana. The daily activities of a householder, which lay people must do, have been given up entirely by us in all its respects, and we have no part in the worry and bother of such activities. Instead, the duty of each one of us is to practice to become supertibanno, one who practices what is good by way of body, speech, and mind. Ujupatibanno one who is going directly towards enlightenment by way of body, speech, and mind. Nyaya Partipanno, one who aims for enlightenment, which is Nyaya Tamma, Tamma that should be known all the time. Samiti Partipanno, one who is always seemly in the way he does things with his body, speech, and mind in all respects. He never gives occasion for being blamed that his ways are at fault in the principles of Tamma and Vinaya that would cause him to deviate from the state of Asavaka of the Lord. Within these four articles of Tamma are the qualities of all the Savakas who made up their minds to behave and practice what was good. If they had deviated from these four, even though they had shaved their heads and eyebrows and put on yellow robes, they would not have seemed to be any different from lay people. If one always has sati to guard and look after one's heart so that the changes and fluctuations of it are known, both when it goes in the wrong way and in the right way, it may be said that one is doing the practice of diligent effort. This is what the practice of diligent effort means, whereas standing, walking, sitting, and lying down are merely the normal postures which we must change from time to time. They are remedial states which preserve our bodies, enabling them to last their lifespan, or, one may say, in order to have comfort and ease in our bodies and minds. But as to whether one can say that one's heart is doing the practice of diligent effort, it depends on sati and banya, for these are what matter. Sati is recollection, in other words, always knowing oneself. Banya is the careful watching or scrutinizing and examining of whatever comes and makes contact and enters from outside or watching and examining the fluctuations of one's heart, which is changing and vacillating all the time, so that one constantly has a present awareness. Anything other than these cannot be called the practice of diligent effort. 
Who is there to uphold the sasana of the Lord Buddha except we who have been ordained and are in the lead of all others? There is no one else in the world who is able to do so, for if the monks are unable to attain magga, pala, and nibbana by means of the way of practice, and if they only have discouragement and laziness, the sasana will just collapse. There is nobody else who is able to uphold it. In particular, it is a most important thing for we who are ordained and who practice what those in the world call kamartana to be constantly aware of ourselves. Otherwise, we will only be worthless people, devoid of value in all actions and wasting the gifts, the four bhattaya, which the lay people give us every day and which they have always obtained with effort. For each time they make gifts to us, it involves no little difficulty and hardship for them. Let us always realize that at present we are ordained monks and followers of the Tathagata. The Tathagata was one who had courage and resoluteness in all kinds of events, whether facing good or evil. He had perseverance and diligence, and he put up with difficulties and hardships of all kinds that he met with. He was not lazy, not one who wakes late in the morning, or one who was selfish, for he was thinking of attaining freedom from Dukkha all the time. These are the basic things for becoming a Buddha, who is the possessor of the principles of Tamma. If we are to become those who know, who are skilled and who follow in the track of the Lord, we must also not be upholders of laziness, thinking only of our stomachs, of carelessness and slovenliness, of getting up late in the morning and thinking only of ourselves, for these are not principles of Tamma which are useful in getting free from Dukkha. All of us ought to know that this is so. Concerning investigating, any one of us who fixes his attention on something, or who is accustomed to contemplate something, must be determined to contemplate so that the aspect of tamma that he is contemplating or fixing his attention upon shall be seen clearly. He must not be without any basis, nor drift with the wind, unable to find an anchor post to hold and restrain him. Wherever sati is established, tamma is sure to arise there. But if one has no sati, then tamma will never arise, for sati is the important thing in the practice of diligent effort. It should always be realized that to let the heart relax and become calm by itself alone is impossible, and none of us would ever see any results from this, even if we went on doing it for the rest of our lives. For the usual state of the heart is to have wrappings which cover it up all the time. These wrappings the Lord called gilesas, and they do not come from anywhere else apart from just one's own heart. As to the training and subjugation of the heart which are done in order to attain calm or the ending of conceit and stubbornness in regard to all these things, these gilesas, it must be dependent on a person who has the diligence and energy to make the constant effort to watch his heart. If anything tends in the direction of what is bad or wrong, he must force himself to give it up until he is able to do so more and more easily, until he is eventually able to give it up entirely with nothing of it remaining. When he is able to give them up entirely, such troublesome things will then no longer be able to harass and bother his heart. Getting free from obstacles and hindrances is normally bound to involve some forcible opposition to them. The Lord Buddha, the Savakas, or any of the famous Atsariyas all forcibly opposed the obstacles and hindrances with which they were faced. Dukkha we know to be one of the Aryazatta. If we have not examined Dukkha and seen it, where will we go to escape from it? Samudaya is the field of the origination of Dukkha. And where does it originate? In the imaginative thinking of the heart. Generally speaking, if one has not had any training, this imaginative thinking of the heart is bound to imagine things which tend in the direction of what is bad or wrong all the time, in that direction which accumulates the gilesas so that they are maintained or increased within the heart. Therefore, the method of fixing the heart, the jitta, which is called pavana, is the way to cure all things which are oppressors weighing down one's heart, so that step by step they are steadily got rid of. While the heart has not yet attained calm, it will not see the value of the sasana, and even we ourselves will appear to have no value at all. But after we have trained and subdued our hearts and attained a state of calm, 
we will certainly see that the tamma has a value and that the sasana is a precious and excellent thing. And even in ourselves, we will feel that we are beginning to be people of increasing worth. Therefore, contemplating the heart is very important, and our set task of extracting and getting rid of these things, these gilesas which we have accumulated, is a more important task than any other. And the practice of diligent effort is equally important. Diligent effort in trying until we see the reasons, the causes and effects behind those things which are tangled up with our hearts, observing and precisely defining them to make them quite clear. For when the eye sees forms, ropa, or the ear hears sounds, they are bound to give rise to feeling in our hearts, and we should then unravel and look at all such things, seeing clearly and fully comprehending them with banya. When the jitta has seen any of these things with banya, it can never again seize and grasp hold of it, nor crave for it, and the heart will let go of it at once. Here, in letting go, we must do so with sati and banya, for without sati and banya as the agents which guard and cure the jitta respectively, it will never attain the ceasing of dukkha. We have been born into this life, and the amount of dukkha that we have we know in our heart. But in particular, we know how much we have today, and tomorrow is sure to be similar. Throughout this life, we are sure to go on living in this way, and as to the next life, we need have no doubt who it will be that suffers. We ought to realize that whoever accumulates or stores away a mass of dukkha or the causes that make for the uprising of dukkha is the one who experiences dukkha today, tomorrow, this life, next life, for this is the one who goes round and round, dying and being born in this wheel of samsara, and receiving dukkha and subservience for how many aeons we know not. It is a long, long road, so long that nobody is able to reckon how far it is from the beginning, in other words, from one's original first birth to the end of the road, which is the freedom of Nibbana. How far is it? How many miles? Nobody can measure it, because this nature is the nature of Bhatta, the round of birth, old age, sickness, and death, which is whirling oneself around all the time. We cannot measure it in miles or kilometers, but we can analyze it, and we must do so by examining the characteristics, lakrna, of this Bhatta, which is whirling oneself around. If any one of us does examine this Bhatta, which is whirling him around, and which has always come into being together with his heart, he will be the one who is able to cure and get rid of Varta, this whirling self, from his heart. And he will reach the sphere of freedom from Dukkha, which the Lord called Nibbana, which arises in just this, his own heart. There is a very important principle in this, so let us all set our hearts to contemplate this and examine it carefully, and don't let us give way to disheartenment and feebleness. Whenever sati is established in any part, that part will be tamma training one's heart, or tamma as the device for curing one's heart so that it becomes calm and steady. This is also the case with banya, for when attention is fixed upon and penetrates into any of the sapawa tammas, one will steadily come to know various skillful ways and tricks from them. Therefore, sati and banya are essential forms of tamma in Buddhism. In the practice of diligent effort, it may be that one does not see any progress towards a state of calm in one's heart. This is the case with those who are absent-minded. When walking jangama in this way, and similarly when sitting, standing, and lying down, they make no special effort with sati and banya. Therefore they cannot attain calm of heart, because they release the jitta and let it go the way of their various emotional moods. They release it and let it go all the time, never restraining or forcibly restricting it, and never making it get into the framework of sati and panya. If one forces one's heart to dwell on any one aspect of tamma or on the parts of the body, taking up any part or parts accordingly, together with sati and tethered by banya, letting one's heart wander about throughout the whole of this bodily framework for a short or a long time, and depending on one's banya to investigate more or less, deep or shallow, gross or subtle, then by investigating in this way, steadily, it will soon lead to calm, to clear, clean, happy states, 
and to being skillful, clever, and wise. What is the cause of this? Someone may have practiced for a long time and not seen any increase of knowledge or excellence in his heart. Let all of us fully understand here and now that his sati and banya have not been established with true determination. He establishes them for one second and then lets them disappear entirely for one hour so that his income and expenditure do not balance. Expenditure being more than income, he is bound to go bankrupt, for he mainly lets his heart come under the sway of Vatta. If he does not guard his heart with Satyanpanya, so that it goes in the direction of getting free from Vatta less than in allowing his heart to go the way of Vatta, his heart will not go towards a state of calm, skillfulness, or cleverness. But all of us understand this now, Otherwise, there will be more nonsense in the future. By day and by night, we do not have to be bothered or worried by anything. Take a look at the things which you should be doing. Look at your own activities. As to the teachers, Aadzariya, and other friends with whom you associate daily, you must not think that they are a load on your mind of which you have to be afraid, nor towards which you must be aggressive, nor should you be disturbed emotionally by them in any way. But if you are wrong in any way, the teacher must point it out, always guiding you in the right way and telling you what is wrong. You must always set yourself to see and follow just what he teaches, but you must not think that he upsets your emotions. Emotions are the most important things, so take a look at the activities of your heart, which is at all times the basis of your emotional state. Otherwise, you will not be able to go towards a state of calm, and you will lose day by day, and the days add up and become months, and the months add up and become many years. Our lives are getting shorter day by day, and the valuable results which we ought to get from the life of virtue are only a little, which is not appropriate for us who are sons of the Tathagata and have come into the circle of the Sasana. The principles of truth are there in the body and the jitta, and we set up sati and banya to penetrate into the basis of the body and the jitta. Why should we not be able to know them? The body and the jitta are tammas which are genuine, or we may say that they are tammas which have always deserved the attention of sati and banya from old times. The Lord Buddha investigated and examined every part of the body as being entirely dukkha, anitta, and anatta, which was the reason why he was skilled, knowing all things clearly with banya. The body of the Lord Buddha and our own bodies are not fundamentally different from each other. So the banya of the Lord Buddha are skillfulness in the same way as with ourselves, and it is only in so far as their breadth and depth are concerned that there is a difference. Why is it that the Lord Buddha was able to bring Satyanpanya to research within the body and to know clearly and see truly into all the Sapawa Tammas? With all of us here, the Sapawa Tammas, which means the body and Jitta, exist here and now, entire and complete. Then why is it that we do not see any results in ourselves? As for Dukkha, whether of the body or of the Jitta, it announces its presence at every moment, so that one who has sati and banya is bound to be in a constant state of trembling with the dukkha which comes and makes contact amidst the jitta, with dukkha and with sati and banya, all of which are together there in the same state. Then why is one unable to know these things which are there and which are also not hidden or secret in any way whatsoever? When dukkha comes from any organ in any part of the body, it cannot remain hidden from the jitta, the one who receives it and knows it. In a similar way, dukkha which arises within the jitta itself also cannot remain hidden from the jitta that receives and knows it. If one has zati ready and waiting to attend to and examine all aspects of this dukkha and to make it clear and plain, and if one meditates with banya to see clearly why this dukkha arose, how it arose, whether this dukkha is oneself or whether oneself has this dukkha, or whether one or another part of this body are dukkha, or whether the whole body is dukkha, or who is the deluded one who goes along with this dukkha, then using banya in this way, how is it that one should not be able to attain the skill and wisdom which comes from one's heart or from one's banya? The reason is just because of drifting of the jitta, which is thus not being set up firmly and unshakably. One has a fear of dukkha, and so one is not able to know and understand dukkha clearly, nor can one reach and grasp sukha to be the wealth of one's heart. 
Dukkha may be much or little, it may come to stay or die away and disappear, but let us understand that Dukkha is just Dukkha. Knowing these things to be Dukkha and investigating and seeing them truly in accordance with the true nature of Dukkha, just this is the way of the heart with Banya. One practices with diligent effort for how many days, months, or years, and one still sees no results, as though Dukkha, which truly exists, went out and hid in a remote cave or abyss, and has not been dwelling within one's own body and jitta at all. There are fish in the water, and there is wealth in the earth, but that one does not catch the fish nor get the wealth to make it one's own is due to oneself. As to the wealth in Buddhism, which is based on the wealth of Sila, the wealth of Samadhi, the wealth of Banya, the wealth of Vimutti, the wealth of Vimutti Nyarna Dasana, these forms of wealth depend upon the practice of each individual, and whether he is able more often to practice strenuously than not strenuously. The results which he should thus receive will differ in accordance with the strength or weakness of the causes which he does and makes. We who have been ordained in Asasana, who are followers of the Tathagata with the full status of what is known as sons of the Sakya, should more than any others be those who possess the wealth of Logotara in progressively increasing stages. In the Tamma which he taught, the Lord said that these stages were Sodapatti Magga, Sodapatti Pala, Sagadagami Magga, Sagadagami Pala, Anagami Magga, Anagami Pala, and Arahatta Magga. Arahattapala, and all this wealth is included in the wealth of Imutti Nyarna Dasana, which is the wealth of Nibbana. The wealth in the Sasana dwells in the sphere of the Svakata Tamma, which the Lord Buddha rightly proclaims, and which is the Niyanika Tamma, able to lead beings who have the intention to follow the way of the Lord so as to be able to steadily get rid of Dukkha. If those who are ordained and who are known as people who practice are still not able to make themselves suited to this Tamma, then it is hard to know who can become accomplished in the Tamma of the Lord, because an ordained Samarna is one who is close to the Lord, both as regards being someone who has little to worry about in the way of affairs and business, and as regards his modes of practice, which are his means for going onward, so that he is able to do and to follow the pattern of the way the Lord went. But in particular, those who also dwell in the forest, which is always quiet and secluded, have the best chance of all to put forward diligent effort for attaining the wealth of Sila, Samadhi, Banya, Vimutti, and Vimutti Nyarna Dasana, for arousing them and developing them, stage by stage, from the grossest stages right up to the most subtle. For Sila and Tamma of all stages are developed for the state of spotless purity, the degree of which depends on the stage of development, and generally speaking this is likely to depend on living in a quiet place away from the crowds both of lay people and those who are ordained in the Sankha. We can see this from the Lord Buddha and the way he brought up the Savakas, for it is evident that he saw danger in mixing with people and affairs that give rise to worry, these being enemies of the Tammas of a Samarna, which is a life of well-being directed in the way of the Tamma of the Lord and his Savakas. At the same time, the Lord saw the value in quietness, and he spoke very highly of it. And so, in all their activities, the Lord and the Arya Savakas were complete in the practice of diligent effort in quiet places, for Tamma likes to arise in quiet places. If it is still not quiet, both externally and within one's heart, Tamma will not arise. But when both these forms of quietness have appeared within a person, Tamma will also begin to appear within him. In other words, Sela will start to become pure, Samadhi will begin to appear in his heart and develop in the stages of Samadhi, and Banya will begin to rise up and move as soon as Samadhi starts to appear, and it will develop into the stages of Banya step by step, all of which depends only on how the person who is doing the practice hurries after what his heart desires without letting any obstacles whatsoever obstruct him. And this is because he is away from those things which irritate and disturb him, and which make his jitta lean towards anxiety and worry from the emotionally disturbing objects which come into contact with him. Summarizing the above, Tamma likes to arise in quiet places and at quiet times. Even those who uphold Tamma, such as the Lord Buddha himself, like to live in quiet places all the time, with the exception of those occasions when he went to perform his functions as the Buddha just to favor those who were fit to be taught. Nyaya. When he saw that it was appropriate, he would then make allowances for the benefit of those who were able to receive teaching from the Lord. But once he had finished doing such Buddha work, he stopped immediately and did not carry on and on like ordinary people everywhere. 
All of us whom people in the world call by the name Gamartana, or those who practice, ought to think somewhat about ourselves and how we are. If we want Buddha, which is purity and skillfulness, to rule over our hearts, we must modify and correct our hearts, our bodies, and our speech, to accord with the way that the Lord led us. Then we will become savakas who have purity in our hearts. We need not doubt this. But if a liking for the affairs of the obscene tamma possesses the heart of anyone, he will think wrongly that tamma likes to arise in the middle of the marketplace, at the crossroads, or where there are crowds of people, such as in the music hall, the theater, the cinema, the radio and television, and that concern with these things will make the world praise him and say that he is the first and best Gamartana monk. This is because he is blind to any other way, and he has no disquietude and fear. For even if they got a lot of bones to hang around his neck as a necklace, he would think of it as though it were a wreath of laurels. This is the obscene tamma which likes to arise with thoughts and understanding which are equally obscene. But even if he makes no external display that is loathsome, it still makes enough of a display in his own heart which is an equally loathsome thing. Please let us all understand this and correct our own actions of body, speech, and heart to accord with the principles of the Tamma of the Lord, then meditating on the Tamma of sorrow in birth, old age, pain, and death, endeavor to get rid of the Gelesas, Tanha, and Abidda, which are our enemies. You must not be careless and uninterested in your activities, but you must encourage and train your Sati and Banya, for these are like a steady sword which must be made capable of fighting against the Gelesas, Danha, and Asava, which are the enemies that tyrannize and compel your hearts at every moment, so that one day you will be able to dispel and finish with this enemy for good. For anyone who has Sati and Banya present within him in all his activities at all times will surely become the owner of the best kind of wealth, which is Magga, Pala, and Nibbana in this lifetime. Today, I wish to emphasize once again that in your Tamma practice, the most important Tammas of all are Sati coupled with Banya, and they cannot be dispensed with for even a moment because sati and banya are the instruments of tamma which make for wakefulness and awareness in the practice of diligent effort, so that any moment when an emotionally disturbing object arises in one's heart or comes from external things, sati and banya do their duty with regard to such disturbing objects which associate with oneself. Then, instead of these disturbing objects that touch one's heart being enemies, they can become things of value by virtue of the power of sati and banya to know them, what they are up to, and why. The establishing of sati starts to be necessary from the day that one begins training in pavana. Whichever parikamma tamma one uses, such as butto, one must establish sati to remain in close association with this form of tamma as though it were truly a matter of life and death. Without wasting any time, the result will then soon appear as a state of calm arising and becoming fully evident. Generally, those who practice and who let time waste away without getting the valuable results in their hearts which they should get, do so because they are careless and lackadaisical, and they do not make haste to take up the full measure of the practice of diligent effort with sati and banya while their age in vasa, rainy seasons, is still small. They let their hearts go out to follow the way of the world until they lack awareness of what they should be doing, and they behave in the manner of people who sell things before they have bought them, which is wrong both in the customary way of doing things in the world and in tamma, and before they become aware of it, it's already too late. The right way to do business is to start by buying at the right price. Then one can sell at a higher price sufficient to make a profit, which covers the cost of living and gives capital for future investment. People who prosper act in this kind of way. As for the way of Tamma, before the Lord became the world teacher, we are told that he made efforts, training himself and practicing austerities, sometimes even going so far as to become completely unconscious. Nobody has ever heard that any of the Savakas or anyone else was able to equal the Lord in this, and he went on doing it for six years without slackening his efforts, and nobody knew whether the Lord would live or die when he went through such suffering and hardship. Up to the day of his enlightenment, 
The practice of diligent effort was never done in fits and starts by the Lord. Thus it was that he made gains for himself and became fulfilled first of all, and afterwards he performed the functions of the Lord Buddha. When the Savakas had heard the Tabma from the Lord, they set themselves to the practice of diligent effort and sought for a quiet place to get rid of the Gilesas and Asavas from their hearts without having any worldly ambitions at all. They were people who, at every breath they took, saw dread in birth and death occurring over and over again. This was because of the strong practice of diligent effort that arose from the heart which saw dread in Dukkha until this dread had become strong enough to support and induce Sati and Banya to work all the time in the body and jitta in all activities without slackening. Then they were able to extract and remove the Gilesas and Dasavas from their hearts by means of Samutse the Pana, overcoming by destroying, and they attained Nibbana while still living at that moment. Thus it was that the Savakas made gains for themselves and became fulfilled first of all, and afterwards they began to do things to benefit the world in whatever ways were appropriate, and to be a help in easing the Buddha's duty. This is how the Lord Buddha and his Savakas did things, not by way of selling before buying, for if he had done things in this way, he could never in truth have been the teacher of the world. Also, if the Salvakas had not followed the way that the Lord Buddha went, there could not have been any who attained the state of Arahant Salvaka to call forth the respect and Buddha of the world, and to cause the world to believe and rely on the third refuge, Zarana. But as regards helping each other in moderate and modest ways, between the world and Tamma it is correct action, Zami Tsigamma, in the world, and there is no harm in it at all. Unless it becomes immoderate and immodest, and both sides forget their duties or the work they should be doing. But in what way should all of us do things for it to be correct action in Tamma, which progresses to higher and higher levels, so that it will be of value to ourselves and to the world in appropriate ways? To begin with, we must set up a firm determination now, for in a short time, it will be too late. If we are going to claim Bhutang Tamang Sankang Saranangatami so that it truly reaches our hearts, we should make haste to follow the Lord Buddha by way of practice, and then train our hearts to keep within the framework of Sati and Banya. Do not give way and let the Gilesas and Asavas drag your heart away, even against your will and with your full knowledge that they are doing so. Make haste to have Sati Panya and the practice of diligent effort to go after your Jitta and forcibly take possession of it away from the Gilesas. Otherwise all will be lost and there will be nothing left of one's status as a Samarna except only a bald head, and there is nothing unusual in that, for anyone can make themselves bald-headed at any time. Do not let yourselves become careless or overconfident and think that the Gilesas are good things and that their extent is small. The Dukkha and torture which is always there pervading beings and Sankaras everywhere so that they can hardly bear it, and they are breaking up and dying in masses all over the world which we are continually seeing right in front of us is due to the Gilesas which are the origin of it all and which drive everything onward in their direction. You must not think that it comes from any other cause, and therefore you must quickly rouse Sati and Banya, which are asleep, so as to wake them up and go after the Jitta and snatch it away from the Gilesas. Let us do this, for we can. Then we shall live, sleep, lie down, be contented and relaxed, in whatever ways are appropriate for those who are Samarnas which, amongst the various forms of occupation that people have in this world, is the one that is cool, and to which they pay homage in Buddha every day. It has already been stated that when Sati and Banya accompany the practice of diligent effort, the Jitta will be able to attain calm and sukha very soon. When the heart has dropped into a state of calm, it is bound to urge on the practice of diligent effort with Sati in that aspect of one's own tamma, whatever it is that suits one, until one can attain a state of calm every time and on every occasion that one wants. When the jitta withdraws, rising up out of the state of calm, one must start to investigate by way of banya, by regarding the parts of the body as being the place for banya to go wandering about in. One may investigate all the parts of the body 
or particular parts, depending on what suits one's character, think reflectively and look at the parts of the body in terms of the tilakna, taking any or all of them, depending on what one finds suitable, but see them clearly by means of banya, then it will be useful. Sati is very important. It is very good never to let it slip and be forgotten, for it will be the means of promoting both samadhi and banya, then it will be useful. Someone who practices and who can endeavor constantly to maintain sati will get on rapidly in all stages of tamma. Even in every little action, one must make sati to be like an elder brother who looks after one all the time. Then it will be impossible for the jitta to gain the upper hand and take charge, because the source of power and merit which will enable one's heart to gain freedom from dukkha in this life is sati. Let us try and make this ordinary sati change and become maha sati, and make ordinary banya change and become maha banya within our own hearts. When sati is strong enough and one directs banya to investigate, even though one's gilesas are all thick and immovable as a mountain, they can be penetrated without doubt. You should understand that all the parts of the persona, the gaya, divided into the groups ropa, vedana, sanya, sankara, and vinyana, are like grindstones for sharpening sati and banya. When sati and banya are associated with these parts all the time without letting up, you need not doubt that you will come to have sati and banya, which are both sharp and strong. So please, just set up sati and the searching thought of banya to go down into the aforementioned sapawa tammas. Calm of heart, from the beginning crude stages developing up to the more subtle refined stages, and the skill and wisdom of banya from the lowest up to the highest levels will then become clearly manifest within this same heart. The asavas which have been allowed to accumulate in the heart since a long time ago will then be broken up and demolished without remainder, even as darkness, which has been in a place for ages, is dispelled and disappears immediately when light comes in. So, if you are wearied of birth and death going on endlessly over and over again, you must hurry up and take up the weapons of sati and banya closely attached to the practice of diligent effort, and do not let up. Then you will see in this heart the fundamental cause that leads to becoming and birth, which leads to their turning into graveyards of beings and of yourself, which is most repugnant and most sorrowful. There is no seeing of any faults and wrongs which one has done in the past to equal seeing the faults and wrongs of the jitta in which poison is buried. In other words, avidda, the ancestor of birth, always there in oneself since uncountable ages past. Having seen as much as this quite clearly with banya, who would knowingly swallow poison? Nobody. He would get rid of it throw it away, and look on it with dread, trembling all over. In a similar way, by seeing with manya the faults and wrongs of the sansara zitta, which is thoroughly immersed in and permeated with poison, one will get rid of it immediately by no longer being able to tolerate the belief that oneself is of this nature. Because there is no calamity to equal that of the jitta which is constantly being stabbed in the back by avidda, and which allows avidda to drive it this way and that, to wander through lives both small and great, being born and dying over and over again. There is nobody who can come and decide to let one go free from dukkha, which is this wheel of the round of samsara, in the way that they can let a prisoner go free from jail. Therefore the Lord Buddha and all the savakas, when they had attained freedom, made an exclamation as though in defiance of the wheel of samsara, such as, The house builder, which is Thanha, can never again build me a house, which is my body, Robagaya, because its vital principle, which is Abhidda, I have destroyed, and now my zitta has attained Vesankara, which is Nibbana. But as for us, when will we be able to make an exclamation like that of the Lord Buddha? Or will we let the Gelesis and Tanha do the exclaiming, mocking, ridiculing, and defying us every day? 
The body and its parts and Sati and Banya exist here as parts of ourselves. And are we not hurt, pained, irritated, and made to feel hot by the words of mockery, ridicule, and defiance of the Geleses and Tanha? In dullness we sit or lie down and listen to their words of mockery and ridicule, carried away in a reverie until we forget ourselves. Is this proper and fitting for we who claim that we are disciples of the Tathagata? How should we overcome our problems, our gilesas and asavas? We ought to think and wake ourselves up by means of the practice of diligent effort. For how did the Lord Buddha and the Savakas overcome the problems and gilesas that faced them, so that they were victorious and able to bring them all to an end? We should hurry to use that method to overcome the gilesas which arises in our hearts until we attain victory like the Lord and will genuinely deserve to be called disciples of the Dattas. Again, sati and panya are tammas which we should be able to build up in our hearts, so we ought not to sit or lie down and wait only for a ready-made sati panya magapala and nibban coming to us from the Lord Buddha or the Atsariyas for them to become our own wealth. And if we do not seek to develop the method of searching with reasoned thought and making changes with the use of our own sati and banya, then whenever they become necessary, which can arise at any time or when an immediate problem arises, where will we be able to find and grasp them in time? For we have never prepared for this from the beginning, and we are bound to have to submit to the duress of the gilesas or any of the other circumstances. Furthermore, neither the Lord Buddha nor the Atsariyas ever praised those who were clever only because of what they had learned by heart from things which were ready-made from other people. But they praised the person who had sati and banya with which he was able to think, search, and discover things for himself alone, and who, with the skillfulness of this Satyan Banya, looked after himself, keeping away from danger. Even though the skillful methods of making Sila pure, and of developing Samadhi and skill in Banya for the attainment of Magga, Pala, and Nibbana were taught by the Lord in moderately deep ways only, yet there are other skillful ways and methods of doing this which are different in special ways and which are up to the skillful ingenuity of each Yogavatara, who, being interested in finding the skill to cure himself, should more and more think and search for himself. Although one who practices ought to be able to attain Magga, Pala, and Nibbana, it should be realized that these do not come by aimlessly drifting, which means without causes and effects, without Sati, Banya, Sadha, faith, and the practice of diligent effort as the key, or as the tools for curing himself. In all the Tamma that has been told here, all of you should realize in your hearts that the Lord Buddha is the Tamma master, which means that the principles of reason were constantly in him, and he never tended to give way to extraneous pressures and influences, for the Lord stood firm in the principles of Tamma throughout from the day that he was enlightened to the day that he passed into Nibbana. Therefore, we should see that the essence of those who are ordained monks is the sacrifice of life at every moment of breathing for the Lord Buddha, the Tamma, and the Sankha, which are the tokens of repayment from the Sasana, which will be our individual immeasurable wealth. Today, the wealth of what is precious in Buddhism has been told so that all of you who listen may know that you will get joyfulness of heart in being the owner of that wealth. This is sufficient for the present time, so I will now end. <laughs>